Why do 99% of writers fail, Corey? So, so many writers have a dream to succeed and they work really hard to learn the skills to grow their talent and they're really dedicated and they, they don't succeed and they feel like, well, you know, I've learned all these tools and I work all the time and I guess I don't have what it takes. I want, if you ever find yourself in that place, I want you to remember something that there's three things that are required. There's a missing piece. So yes, skill, talent. Talent is repeatable skills. You have to be able to write in conflict. You have to be able to write great characters and dialogue and heightened concepts. Yes, all of that, yes. And you're gonna probably have to work hard to develop that. But once you do, and you have that talent, you obviously need dedication, right? You have all the talent in the world. If you don't work hard, not gonna happen. Okay, but you have all the talent, you have all the dedication, and you can fail which then tells people, I guess I don't have what it takes. I want you to think about Bruce Springsteen. He's pretty good, right? Uh, he's not a rock and roll star, he's a rock and roll god. And I think he would agree, incredibly talented. I think he would agree, incredibly dedicated. He didn't go to college, he didn't get married, he was just playing music all the time for like 10 years for no money, just he was all in on his dream and worked so hard on his ability he got a record deal at Columbia. He had a year to make his album. They supported him with money and background music and they promoted the heck out of it and it went out and it bombed. The great Bruce Springsteen bombed. And I gave him a second chance because they saw his potential. So he spent another year and just poured, I mean, everything into the second album. And they spent so much money on promotion. And it's Bruce Springsteen, so you know what happened. That second album bombed. It's very easy at this point to say, I was pretty good at music. It's made two albums. The biggest record company in the world is promoting it. Nobody wants to listen to it. I guess I don't have what it takes. But God smiled on Bruce Springsteen and he got a third chance. And his third album was Born to Run. And his third album is one of the most successful records of all time. It sold tens of millions of copies. It made him a rock and roll god. In the 1970s, if you wanted to be famous, there's two things you could do. Get on the cover of Newsweek or get on the cover of Time magazine. In the same week, Bruce Springsteen was on the cover of Newsweek and Time. No other musician has ever done that. So I have a question for you. What was different from the third album, from the first two albums? He had all the talent, he had all the dedication, but there was something missing. It's not luck. There's no luck involved. Luck is what the losers point to. Born to Run is a transcendent, magical album. It would have been so successful if it came out 10 years earlier, 10 years, heck, if it came out today as a brand new album, it would be amazing. What is different? If you are serious about writing or acting or directing, whatever your creative pursuit is, you need to know this answer. What was different and what was different was John Landau. John Landau was a writer for the Rolling Stone, discovered Bruce, knew that Bruce was just a generational talent. And after the second album, he went to Bruce and said, can I be your producer? Can I produce your third album? And they met and they talked and Bruce trusted him and respected him and Bruce said yes. Now John Landau did not produce the first album, did not produce the second album, he produced born to run. And what I'm about to say is something that Bruce Springsteen and John Landau have said publicly many times, so I'm just sharing what they said. John Landau said that what he needed to do was adjust, not very much, but he had to adjust Bruce's process. We live in a world where people ignore process. They, they focus on results, success or failure. Process is how you create product. I can always track the best scripts back to the best process. And I work with writers, I can always track their scripts that fail back to failed process. Process, process, process. If you were a golfer and you weren't getting the results you wanted, you would see someone who would break down your swing and re-engineer your swing because your swing is your process. As a writer, if you're writing and not getting the results you want, what writers do is they either quit 
or they just double down and keep writing scripts thinking, well, you gotta be in the right place at the right time. And they keep writing and they create a pile of similarly flawed scripts. Process, process, process. You have to improve your process. The great Bruce Springsteen needed an adjustment in process. So who can do that for you? Managers can do that for you. Uh, mentors, writers. It's something I do in my workshops and also one-on-one, -on -one, but not taking one-on-one -on -one clients. Or if you don't have the money or you don't have the time, uh, you're fortunate to live in a time when there's so much free digital content. So you can go back and watch, if you haven't already, a lot of Film Courage videos. You can also go to podcasts. And there are a lot of writers who talk about their process. Now, it's really important that you don't just find a writer that you love and say, oh, I'm going to do her process. No, no, no. There is a process that allows Tina Fey to write to the best of her ability. There's a process that allows, you know, Greta Gerwig to write to the best of her ability. That's not the process that's going to allow you to write. you got to find your process. So when I work with writers, I do process coaching. And what I always tell a writer, and I specifically want to tell this to any of you who never work with me, I always tell a writer, I am not smart enough to look at your writing and talk to you and know what process is going to work best for you. You're not smart enough to know. You have to experiment. I will tell you this. Most writers' default process holds them back. Most writers' default process plays to their strengths and hides their weaknesses. And if you keep doing that, your weaknesses get weaker and your strengths get stronger. So when I do this work with writers, I will give them a range of processes to use to see what the results are. And then we'll start to fine tune and start to find your process. And you do not have to work with me. Um, it's cool that you can, again, if you have some time and energy, listen to the Film Courage videos, listen to podcasts, listen to very successful writers. They'll talk about their process. So you could start to collect lots of different writers' processes and you could start playing with some of those and experimenting with some of those. If you're not going to work with me, let me give you a piece of advice. Find seven writers that you really respect. That, that talk about their process. Not all writers do, but a lot of writers do because there's so much you know, uh, interviews out there. So find at least seven writers that you respect who share their process and write down what their process is. And then what I want you to do is look at those processes, those seven processes, and say, which one do I think is gonna work best for me? And then which one would I be most excited to try? It might be the same one, might be a different one. And then, okay, which one do I know isn't gonna work for me? There's no way. Start with that one. Start with that one. Because writers, I always tell writers this, either you control your process or your process controls you. I'll just give you an example. I worked with a writer, really smart, had a manager, but couldn't get a career. And in working with their process and getting to know them, it became clear that when they had a problem with their script, they had to make a really big decision, solve a big problem. They'd get anxious and stressed. Most people do. And they think about it until they could find a really good solution and they'd use it. That's a flaw in your process. So what I said is, okay, so you have this script and you have this problem and you have this solution, which makes a lot of sense. Great. I want you to pretend that your agent said, I cannot go out to the marketplace with a script that has this solution. I need you to come up with a different solution and you got to pitch it to me in three days. Come back in three days and pitch me that solution. And then I said, okay, I want to pretend that your man or agent said, nope, you have three days, you get me a different solution or I drop you. And come back in three days and then I do it. I'm going to have them do four or five. And here's what they're going to realize. Some of the time, their first one, the first good one they came up with is the best. Sometimes the fourth one is the best. And I asked them, do you want to write the fastest script, the easiest script, or the best script? Do you want a chance of a career or do you want the best chance of the best possible career? So this is what it takes. When you're stuck on a problem, don't use the first good solution you come up with. That goes on the option list. Come up with five 
seven other great options. And then I'll say, why don't you think of the worst option, the, the, the way you know would be a disaster, and just go write that real quick. Try all this out. That's, that's what creativity is. Creativity is an exploration. And we often learn more from our mistakes than our successes. So that's just one example of a process glitch where smart people will have a problem, they'll think about it, they'll come up with their first good answer and use it without exploring other options. And sometimes if they're pushed to do that, the sixth option they come up with is going to be the reason they have a career. I'll give you one more example of a process glitch. I worked with another writer, super talented, always close to her career, never had a career. And in working with her, it became really clear that she really connects with her characters. She really feels and sees them as real people. And she has like a, a maternal instinct to protect her characters. And so I started to give her a process training where she had to take the character she loved the most and just do the brutally worst things to these characters. She had to kill her characters in the worst possible ways. It was so painful. But then when she was done, she's like, you know, that was kind of fun. I mean, the character's still there. I'm still there. And because if you're protecting your characters, if you're protecting them from pain or yourself from the pain, you can only go so far as a writer. Um, you know, the reason Breaking Bad and Fleabag and The Bear are so great is those writers are so courageous. They just go into their pain and they write from there and they do not protect the characters because we want to have an emotional experience. We want to be emotionally changed. And this is, it's really important. And I'd like to sort of talk about it, if you permit me, in a much bigger way. Um, Everything in life seems to divide us and everyone's on teams and one team has all the answers and the other team are idiots and the other team has all the answers and they're an idiot and corporations and governments often do things to keep us aroused and angry and suspicious because that is how they can keep our attention and they can get us to watch and they can get us to buy or to donate. And this is not a, a problem for one side or the other. It's a problem for everyone. And let me share a quote, um, a really great quote from James Baldwin. And he says, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with their pain. And I think that's really powerful. I can resonate and connect with that. I think that um, there's a lot of pain that people don't want to experience. And then we live in a society that says, don't deal with your pain, cope with your pain. And one way of coping with your pain is this medication or alcohol or work a lot or sex or just get really angry at the other side and just live in this perpetual self-righteous anger. And I think as a society, we've sort of lost our ability to deal with pain. And you know, we used to have rituals when people died or terrible things that we came together and there were rituals, but, but a lot of those rituals have fallen away in the modern world. And there's just a lot of hatred and anger and fear because there's a lot of pain that people don't want to face. And so it's so important that you can, as a writer, write from that pain, don't protect your characters because that is one of the ways you can help make the world a better place is that you can tell stories like Fleabag, um, where characters choose or are forced to confront their deepest pain and come out the other side a better person, a more whole person, a more healthy person. We need to viscerally, like, you can't just lecture people. You can't just people, can't tell people to do that. They'll just tune you out. But you create a character that they, they spend their lives with that they're viscerally connected to they get to experience that. Or you could do the opposite, like Succession or The Bear, where you can have characters who refuse, refuse to deal with their inner pain. And they just live in this, just this aroused hatred, suspicion, and you just see the destruction. These are important. I mean, writing can help make the world a better place because writing is how we get shared values. 
It, it's how we get empathy. It's, it, it can bring people together. It's one of the few things that Red America and Blue America, we, we can viscerally be excited by similar stories. I mean, God help us if that goes away. So I know I, I got on my soapbox and I apologize, but I was talking about process and how important process is. So um, if you can get someone to help you with process, do it. It's going to expedite your learning curve. It is going to dramatically increase your chances of success. If Bruce Springsteen could use it, we all could use it. But if you can't find someone, a mentor is willing to do it for free, and you can't pay someone like myself or someone else, um, it, it'll be longer and harder, but you could still do this. You're fortunate to live again in this era where you can listen to different writers' process. Just remember, everyone's focused on outcome and product. Process is how you create outcome. Improve your process, improve your outcome. You don't improve your process, you keep making the same mistakes. Simple as that. So when John Landau took Bruce Springsteen under his wing or however it worked, was that Bruce's blind spot? His process? Oh. We um, talked about that earlier. Yeah, so spot. for me, there's strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots. Blind spots are weaknesses you don't know you have. Um, weaknesses are weaknesses you know you have. I don't know. They, neither of them identify that. I okay. can't speak for Bruce. But I'll tell you what John Landau did for him. Um, and it's something I went into great detail in a, uh, a previous Film Courage or an upcoming Film Courage video. I don't know the order these are going to be. Where I talked about there's one question you have to answer uh, for your script to succeed or one answer or your script will fail. Uh, and if you haven't yet watched that, watch that Film Courage video because that, that singular what's it about, that is the tweak in the process that John Landau used. So in that album, Bruce had all of these lyrics. He had all of this experience. And this is what's important. What's it about? It's not intellectual. It's not theme. It's about what do people experience. Even if you don't consciously know you're experiencing it, you're experiencing it. Because that's what we want. We want impactful experiences. And so they looked at that and they realized there was a lot of different experiences at that time because Bruce had all these different songs. And in fact, Born to Run, uh, he shared, I think he had like 40 pages of lyrics. And I would imagine they were all just amazing. But it was the question of, and this is the most important decision, what's it about? And they worked on it for a long time. And finally, this is what they came up with. This is the unifying experience of Born to Run. And you listen to any of the songs and you're going to feel this. It's about friendship. Look at the cover art for the album. Listen to the songs. It all makes you feel friendship. I mean, it's a lot of it is like what friendship felt like when you were 20 or 22 years old in the summer and like you had infinite freedom and all these possibilities. You know, it was a, it was a romantic friendshipy feeling, but everything in that. So he took those 50 pages of lyrics and he talks about this and he reduced it down to half a page that focused on that piece of land that, that what's it about. So in, in that video that, uh, you can see or will soon see when it drops, um, which is the one question you have to answer about your script. I go into great detail about uh, the what's it about. Um, it was cool. I, I learned it from Ridley Scott, um, and it was many years later that I watched a documentary that uh, Bruce made about Born to Run, and he talked about it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 that's what it, that, and then of course, of course, like this is just, it's the one question all artists need. I um, have heard Steve Martin talk about how he creates or used to create his routine and other, it's the same, Richard Pryor, the same thing. So this is like the secret to the creative universe.